But those of us who recognize that what we've done has not fulfilled us, we mm -hmm. have not reached that finish line, what I call the finish line of peace, um, we, to, to hope that we still have time mm -hmm. to figure that out and maybe change our our life's trajectory and even yeah. the possibility of go of, of, of finding others that have hurt us and forgive them yeah but also find another version of who we are to forgive ourselves yeah yeah Welcome to the America's Podcast, where we pursue what it means to become a next level neighbor, creating a place we enjoy with the people we love. I'm your host, John Schroeder, and today I am joined by Tom Harrison. Tom is an author and also a business consultant. Tom, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Hey, John, how are you? It's great to be here with you today. Thank you. Absolutely. Now, I noticed on your form that you lived on uh, College Street, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, College Street, uh, there's another road uh, called Harold. It's a beautiful street. It is. Um, in fact, when I was moving here, I was looking at, I think it was 523 Herald, such a great little home. Mm -hmm. um, and it went off the market. And so God didn't obviously lead us to, to end there. Uh, but uh, there's some really great places. It, even the old high school that's down there, mm -hmm. um, just so much great potential. Yes, so, beautiful street. Um, I'm always wondering too, just being a part of the, the neighborhood and the community, have you heard anything about that particular area and kind of what they're hoping for for that school? I have not heard a thing. I, I obviously they, they they moved to the new school about two years ago. I think they finally yeah. finished it up, and so uh, I've not heard what might be the future of that of yeah. that property. Yeah, it's such a great facility. Really I mean, is. obviously, yeah. I know there's a lot of renovations, but it still seems like it's a great area to it put is. something. Yeah, um, I agree. I I even thought about uh, a community center or something like that. It's got a such basketball a court. It's got yeah. a running track. Obviously, it's got everything that a, that a high school would typically have. Yeah, so that's it's right. A, it, it's a property that's. Just is dying for someone to come in and do something with yeah, it. That's for yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. I'll definitely be praying for that because it's such a great area. Sure it is. Um, so, so yeah, Tom. So um, this is our first time actually meeting yes. one another, and so as we always do, uh, we love to ask the question primarily, or at least uh, first, is who are you? That's the idea. It's not just what you do that defines you, but who you are. And so you get a chance to to do that with us uh, today. So can you tell us a little bit about your background and kind of what inspired you to even become a writer? Mm -hmm and a business consultant? I know that's a, a loaded question, and so you just take it as you like it. Well, I, I'm having to start by embracing being an Americussian, I guess, with the gnat in my face, so my yeah. apologies. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I, I was born and raised many decades ago in Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, wow. Uh, I was actually a child of 16-year-old parents, and so, uh, and there were, there were the obvious challenges even back then as mm. to uh, having, having very young parents uh, yeah. and growing up in that environment. But was very fortunate to uh, not only have uh, uh, was was uh, born and raised around a really good family structure, mm. but I was able to out to really bust out and kind of see the world. And so I spent a lot of my time pretty much living all over the country until okay. finally landing in America so about nine years ago. Yeah. Wow. So so what what made you kind of that travel person? Was there was there um, a career? Uh, were family dynamics? It was primarily career. I, I yeah. think it, admittedly. Uh, it, it had some challenges growing up. And in mm -hmm. Memphis, though, I think like every hometown, our, our hometowns can either be a protagonist or an antagonist when it get, if you refer to, to book yeah. writing. And, and that was certainly the case uh, in, in me growing up. Love Memphis, great culture, mm -hmm. but the, the family dynamic was a challenge. And so uh, I really sought out opportunities outside of the area where I grew up in. Yeah. And so uh, one thing led to another and uh, out of college ended up of all places is Alaska. Wow. And then it just kind of rolled from there. So <laughs> Yeah. Well, what kind of what kind of uh, personality were you? Were you an uh, introvert, extrovert? Uh, did you did you find joy in relationships? Were you kind of a sports person? Tell me a little bit about you just kind of I, I would call myself an introvert with a switch. Okay. Uh, I, I, I think I prefer to just kind of be be with close family, friends, my wife, uh, and really not really get, go out too far. Mm -hmm. But I, in all my career, I've been in a situation where I've had to take 
my personality and 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 project out something different than than what I was let's say 100% comfortable with at home. Yeah. So, but but it worked out well for me. I've had a wonderful career in what I've done and uh, uh but yet home is my home and that's kind of my safe place. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh even going into high school, uh you'd mentioned kind of career uh, did you always kind of know that that's what you wanted to do was get into business and writing or where did, where were those? Well, writing never came until later, much later in life. It only started about 10 years ago. Uh, but I, I did start out in accounting, okay. uh, and then evolved into finance. And so I, I was, I, again, kind of feeling comfortable with a, with a kind of personality where, People like accountants and finance people. They like order. Mm-hmm. They like they like their world as much in order as possible. And so, gravitating to uh, I was a public a certified public accountant my first part of my career. Okay, and then ended up working with Wall Street firms and in institutional investment management for about three decades. And so, okay. but loved it. Had a great time with it. Traveled all over the world with it. And ended up, of all places, America's Georgia. Yeah, yeah, that seems like a lot. I mean, to be able to experience that. What was what was it like uh, when you first heard about America's and came to America's? What was that? What was the expectation like? And then what was kind of the reality that set in? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I had zero expectations, and I think being a long term kind of big city dweller. Mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily come down to America's kicking and screaming, Mm -hmm. but I did follow my lovely wife who had had an amazing career opportunity down here with one of the institutional kind of businesses here, Magnolia Manor. Oh yeah. And so uh, she was, she's one of the few people that, that helped run Magnolia Manor in the human resources area. And she had just a great opportunity to come down and not only just have a good job, but Mm -hmm. make an impact. And she really wanted to do that. So we closed our eyes. We, we we prayed quite a bit, and we, and then we said, "All right, let's let's uproot and come down to Americus," and and we've loved it ever since. Yeah. So, how do you describe Americus to those that say, "Hey, Tom, how are things going? What 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 should I expect going down there?" Wow. Um, you know, it, it's it's a it's a what I would call a beautiful small town, mm-hmm. but with enough legs under it to where you can really feel like it's got some livelihood. Yeah. It's got some strength. It's got beauty to it. And so uh, we've we've been fortunate again. Again, it's been about nine years since we've been down here, and uh, and, and but as much as any city or town this size, it's not the physical buildings. Even though there's a lot of uh, there, there, there is quite a bit of beauty and, and, and character associated with the buildings, and uh, but it's the people. It's the yeah. people who were born and raised here. Uh, again, being kind of silly, uh, silly city people uh, coming into the into a more rural area, it took a little getting used to. Mm-hmm. And, and 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 fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, uh, our first project when we moved here was to 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 uh, rehab a house uh, that was three years younger than the Windsor Hotel. And so it has wow. it has legs yeah. under it itself <laughs> and hadn't been uh, lived in in six years. And so, uh, but but we lowered our head and spent the, the following four years renovating it. And, and, and by doing that, that allowed us to be, to build the connection within the city. Yeah. Uh, is that people drive by and go, what, wow, you've been working out that a long time. Uh, and uh, so we, but we had a lot of people who, we're admiring what we're doing, and yet at the same time, probably looking at us, going, "Why are you? Why were you spending so much time and money? Yeah, we're yeah. rehabbing such a, uh, a a old home, but mm-hmm. it's it was a wonderful journey, and we love living there. I love that. So, did, so did you have to uh, change a business uh, as well, moving down here? Were you able to work remotely, or what was I was like? able to work uh, remotely. I, I I evolved into my well. I, I had walked away from my career, uh, kind of a nine to five office job right before I moved down here with Diane, my wife. Okay. And, uh, and I, I began to do two things. One is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, do the research associated with writing uh, a book that I had just published a few months ago. But also was able to, to expand my business consulting effort virtually. So yeah, wow. I, I've got half a dozen clients pretty much from coast to coast and, and a couple here in Georgia. And so it's really been a great time to be down here and, and, and do virtual as far as work is concerned. Yeah. I, I would assume like anything, uh, especially in the last <clears throat> 10, 15 years, things have changed and Quite just trying to adapt. And And there's some good things about that. There's some difficulties, sure. obstacles that come along sure. uh, with that as well. So you talked about this idea of order and that attracted you to this particular business style. Yes. Love order, love numbers. Where where did that desire come from? Was 
there was there some other things that you wanted to go ahead and connect with and say this is something that I can be a part of? Uh, like, what are some underneath kind of values that uh, that uh, that also attracted you to that? <sighs> Wow, that's a that's a deep question, John. Uh, probably one of the best questions I think I've ever heard being asked of me because I, I think the 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 search for uh, for order, uh, at least in my life, came from somewhat of a lack of order in my youth. And so, uh, once I discovered that that I had the aptitude and and, and really was able to excel in that area, uh, that tend to I, I really heavily gravitated to that and and really helped me kind of, I would say, wash away some of the past of my, of, of my difficult upbringing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, and I feel like that is a part of the healing process it too, is. right? Absolutely. Being able to, 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 to notice those things. And yet there are certain things that are always just beyond our control. And so sure. we're trying to process that as well. That's and true. so, uh, outside of just the business aspect, uh, were there some personal things that also helped you kind of create that order, at least search it out, uh, and be able to find a little bit more stability? Well, I, I think that during the first, I would say, four plus decades of my life, I was pretty much a very high achiever. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, I thought it was the right thing to do, to be the father, to be the husband, to be the provider, to be the, and, and to be the, the, the employee of the, mm -hmm. of the company that everyone would admire. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, I think over time, I realized that I had fallen into a trap uh, mm -hmm. associated with that. Uh, turned, that, that. That desire to achieve turned into more of a desire to uh, achieve wealth. Mm -hmm. and, and, that, and that changed me. And so uh, it was the latter years of really seeching, uh, searching out my, my, my spiritual journey mm -hmm. uh, and finding it through some very important people, including my wife, having I mean, come into my life a, a decade or so ago. Mm -hmm. uh, helped me kind of fine tune and understand the really true purpose of how I was created and what I was supposed to do in this world yeah. for the rest of my life. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> now you, you mentioned that you had, you noticed that there needed to be change. Was that like a, a, a dramatic thing or was that more of a, a, a progressive thing that you just noticed over time? Your wife was able to help notice those things as well. well that's a very good question. I, I think, I, I think over time, tension can can build mm -hmm. when you realize that the 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 ultimate pursuit or at least what we thought were the goals of pursuing mm. the, uh, in life uh didn't provide the benefits that you think it would yeah. and i think it, and, and unfortunately when we're in our 20s and 30s we don't listen to anybody mm -hmm. we just think no i gotta i gotta get the house i gotta have the 2.7 kids i gotta have the uh the, the car the second car the boat whatever ends up being and for mm -hmm. me it just kept ratcheting up mm -hmm. and so it, it but as I was ratcheting up, I realizing I was not a, it, it was not actually making me feel better. It was actually making me feel worse. Wow. I was carrying more in my life than I ever wanted to carry, mm -hmm. uh, and and I wasn't fun to be around. Uh, mm -hmm. The people that were in my life were uh, I, I let's just say that I, I I could have treated them a lot better than I did, yeah. and so it was a gradual tension, and then finally it all just came boom, all, yeah. all came. I would say crashing down, but certainly became overly aware to me that I needed to make a change. Yeah, yeah, and and I don't know, like you said, I mean, when I'm in, I'm 39 years old now, but even in my 20s and, my, and throughout my 30s, there's just this passion, desire to to make impact, to be as aggressive sure. as possible, Absolutely. to conquer things. But every time I've talked with someone who is above me, whether that's in age or wealth or experience, will always tell me, John, you're running and it, there's nothing there. There's nothing at the end of that, except for sometimes I would say disappointment because what we're, 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 I feel like what we're kind of looking for is peace. Like we want peace. We exactly. want peace with God and with man, and we don't know how to do that. So we're trying to do all these things to fix it. And so I think discontentment is something that's hard for us to to, um, to process. It is. Um, and I think for those, or maybe few of us, I'm hoping a lot more, but those of us who recognize that what we've done has not fulfilled us, we mm -hmm. have not reached that finish line, what I call the finish line of peace. Um, we, to, to hope that we still have time mm -hmm. to figure that out and maybe change our traject our life's trajectory and even yeah. the possibility of go of, of, of finding others that have hurt us and forgive them yeah. but also find another version of who we are to forgive ourselves yeah yeah 
Absolutely. And that's why relationships are so important because we get to kind of walk through that process together. We get to, to, to notice our blind spots. We get to be able to kind of wrestle with how we're actually relating uh, to one another. And so that, that, that helps because we've got to put people in our lives that will be able to speak into that. We have to trust somebody or or several people. And for me, it was certainly my wife, uh, uh, but also small group environment where, Mm -hmm like-minded people are together and they're and 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 for guys it's it's quite a bit different yeah. I, and, and i don't want to stereotype guys mm-hmm. versus gals here but yep. um it, for men it's just difficult uh yeah. we don't we don't share well yeah and we and we don't talk openly very well yeah all. i was about to ask that about the kind of the taboo stuff of probably as you were growing up th- there are certain things that you're not supposed to talk exactly. about exactly and so now uh with this this new generation of like hey let's let's express these thoughts and these emotions so that we can actually deal with them instead of them just constantly compiling so for for, for someone like myself and certainly a lot of men we have to feel like we need to be given permission mm-hmm. to pull the emotions that have that we've been carrying uh and maybe deep dark and difficult emotions that we've carried for most of all our lives mm-hmm. we, we need to find someone that'll say, you know what, that's okay to let somebody know, whether mm-hmm. it be your counselor or your pastor or a small mm-hmm. group or best friend or your wife or whatever it turns out to be. Mm-hmm. It's amazing if you if you go down that path, the kind of release and and, and that that can occur yeah. that can really point someone who has struggled Mm-hmm. To a to a direction of peace and and uh, and and tranquility, like a better way of saying it. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely. I, I would say, as harsh as this may sound, but it's definitely, in my opinion, it's a lie to believe that expressing your emotions is weakness. True. Absolutely. Actually, it's absolutely. actually strength because no, if you can do that, then you make yourself vulnerable, which actually makes you better because you learn, you can adapt, and you can change. Right. You have never seen an opportunity as dramatic as a group of men who will sit there and after and after a few weeks of when you first meet and you shake your hand, hi, I'm Tom and I I do this and this, this is kind of the the puffing up of what men tend to do. And within a few weeks of <clears throat> excuse me, of sharing and 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 opening up and maybe their tears, mm-hmm. you are hugging these guys, you're telling them you love them. It it is it is it is a it, it can be a life changing moment for a lot yeah. of people, yeah. in particular men. So how has your relationships with specifically with with other men, how has that changed since you've learned that? I ran into a guy uh towards the latter part of my kind of my last career before getting into consulting. And I was, I, I got to tell this story, Jack, because yeah. I think you'll really appreciate this. So I, I owned my own investment firm. I just, it's a, it was a fledgling firm. We were just getting started. We were so excited. It was very hard driving uh, kind of firm. And uh, my business partner, who was a, who was a, a, a quite, quite a Christian, a very, very devout Christian, he comes walking in with this guy. Uh, his name is Larry. And he wanted to introduce me to Larry. And Larry was, had just started a ministry. And I and my and my first thought was, why am I meeting him now? I'm at work. What are we doing? He says, Well, we're gonna we're bringing him in to be a, a, a Christian facilitator, a spiritual facilitator for the firm. And I go, Wait a minute, we're partners. And I, I don't and and yeah, I go to church and everything, but you know, he's a nice guy. He's got a great face, but I'm too busy for this. Mm-hmm. I, I'll go to church on Sunday, and we'll and we'll and we'll I'll take care of that. Well, Larry sat down and he began to tell me his story. And his story before he started his ministry mirrored mine to wow. the T. And I became mesmerized. Mm-hmm. And he told me about a broken life he had and had to. And and he was he was about ready to to. to uh, he was in the middle of potential divorce and he was at a big Fortune fifty company, traveling around the world, doing doing extremely well. And until he went on a silent retreat one weekend, mm-hmm. and he said for that was he was locked into a room for three days with nothing but but silent, silently talking to God. Mm-hmm. And that changed him completely. And so he walked away from everything and started this ministry. And my point was, is that because his, his life mirrored mine mm-hmm. at that, uh, up to that point, yeah. I began to realize there might be an avenue, there might be a path mm-hmm. for me to look at someone like you, let's say, yeah. who has a wonderful, peaceful look about you, John, mm-hmm. that I, I can potentially walk through life mm-hmm. and have that level of peace that I can show the world. Mm-hmm. I want to know what that path was. And yeah. so that's what started my, my journey, veering away from the business side and, and more towards, can I be something different? Can I be someone better? Yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that story. I, I, and what, what amazes me too, 
too is that even with within this new trajectory for him, we're not saying don't have drive, mm-hmm. don't have energy, don't have passion for mm-hmm. something. I just think it's very difficult to understand what is the balance between that drive and passion and contentment. Yes. Because there's got to be a line. There's got to be a moment where you're like, this is my lot, Mm -hmm. and I'm satisfied in that. There may be more to my lot than someone else. My fence might be a little bit bigger, but if I start looking over my fence and saying, I want more, then that begins to control us, right? So how do we know what our fence is? How do we know how big our lot is? I think it's just always going to be a struggle for young, especially entrepreneurs, people that are passionate. And I I don't know the answer to that. Um, Do you have anything that uh, that you've just, in your opinion? The only thing I could tell you is I'm guilty as charged, uh, Your Honor. I mean, that's exactly what happened to me. And I couldn't get off that hamster wheel. Mm-hmm. Until I had I had pretty much been broken, yeah. and so um, and it really it 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 it, it I got to roll back a little bit and yeah, say please. the impetus of this was the fact that I grew up with a very young father who did not want me who was unfortunately bipolar was an alcoholic and made it pretty clear in life that that one I would never measure up to any level that he would accept me mm-hmm. by. Uh, and yet I was still in his life. He's still having his life. And so it's almost like he was dragging me around them, uh, on the ground, uh, mm-hmm. wherever he went, even though he didn't want to carry me around anywhere. Yeah. And so, uh, I, I, it was that over that, that immediate desire to overcome that mm-hmm. and then began to overshoot that. Yep. And I couldn't get off of it because again, that there was no lay, no level that I could reach that would achieve what I, what I felt like I needed to achieve to be the son that I thought I want, I tried to be for him. Yeah. Yeah. So. And it does seem like we've got to get to a place where we actually can contemplate that, where you have to have time to really wrestle with that. And a lot of times what that looks like is actually silence and solitude. That's it's true. not in the busyness. In fact, I read a book uh, last probably three years uh, by a guy named uh, John Mark Comer, which is called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Hmm. And he said that hurry is actually our enemy. And he says, it's not being busy, it's being too busy. Hmm. Too busy mm-hmm. to sit down and 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 really contemplate. What am I reflecting? What am I doing here? Why am I here? And many of us, again, whether it's within business or relationships, we're going so fast that we don't have time. Our souls can't even keep up with our bodies. I think sense. the key to that, John, is the potential of the key to changing that is surrounding yourself with the right people. Mm. That that have that ability to slow you down, to yeah. to show you a different version of who you are, to to show a softer side of the world, and and I've been very blessed to have had a, a several people, including my lovely wife, to 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 help help get me to that point. Yeah, and, and so that that's extremely important. Is but to get there, yeah. you have to become vulnerable. It's back yeah. to what <laughs> we were saying earlier. Yeah. We need to be yeah. vulnerable. We need to go. I need to take a risk. I need to take a chance. I need to sh- share with someone what's when I'm dying to 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 bust out of me yep. to say I am I, I I don't like myself. How do I fix it? Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things we talk about here about being a next level neighbor is one who can care for and think about and affect other people's lives. But when we're so consumed, right, with our own ambitions and our needs and we're we're not healed. Right. And we're not healing. Right. It's so hard because it we're is. we're so convinced that we have to fix ourselves that we can't look out. And so part of that vulnerability is saying, I need to become vulnerable because other people also need me. That's exactly right. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and I don't need to just um, be transactional in my relationships. I don't need just need to say, well, if you're not benefiting me, then I'm out. And unfortunately, being transactional was uh, the, the hallmark of most of my life. Yeah. Wow. Because that's how... The world yeah. centered around me. That's how I, I define success. And it, again, it wasn't until I realized that I was far from success mm. and certainly way far from being at peace uh, by, by pursuing it the way that I had. So yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about kind of what you're doing now. And sure. so we talked a little bit about this this book uh, that's, that's new. It's out, all right? It's available to others. Um, and so tell me a little bit about the book itself. And again, just some inspiration of why it's, why, why it's here now. Okay, I appreciate that. So about 10 years ago, I, it, in my desire to, to, to pursue this other person that I, that I felt was somewhere deep inside me, mm-hmm. I walked away from my profession and reconnected with a family member, a same-age uncle, 
that 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 lived in Memphis, and um, he grew up. His 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 father was my step grandfather. Okay. So my grandfather passed away in a horrible accident uh, before I was born, and my grandmother remarried, and she had her fifth child. His first uh, was my uncle, and unfortunately, he grew up with a horribly physically abusive father. Mm -hmm. And I and there were many memories of me growing up around the 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 the, the physical abuse, and then come to find out some sexual abuse that was going on with amongst mm -hmm. his half sisters, my aunts, and so anyway. So I reconnected with him, and we began a, a journey that we hadn't we hadn't really hadn't seen each other in twenty years. Mm. I'd gone off and done what I, I I was doing. He unfortunately had spent most of his life on uh, alcohol and uh, and drug uh, dependent, was homeless most of his life, mm. had been in and out of, of the judicial system at least four dozen times. So when I re, when I reconnected with him to really say. I want to roll back to the beginning. I need someone who was with me. We were very close when we were young. Um, I want, want someone with me to, to kind of say, hey, where where am I? What what, what am I doing? And admittedly, yeah. I started to, to I started out our, our, our relationship or restarted our relationship, maybe slightly more on the selfish side mm -hmm. of saying, my uncle, his name's John. So John, I'm looking for help. But in reality, he was obviously the one that needed the help. And so I I I I wanted to see what I could do to 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 move down the path with him in such a way that could benefit him. But um, we started a series of journeys together, road trips is what I call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we spent time, we began to kind of peel the onion. Mm -hmm. What happened in his life? What happened in my life? Um, and why do we? Why did? Why were we so close to each other mm -hmm. growing up, and having gone completely different opposite directions? Me. Mm -hmm couple of college degrees, uh, jobs all over the country, him unfortunately being addicted the way he was addicted and, and struggled in his life. And yet, John, we were at the same point in our life. Mm. We had like, we'd gone complete circle and we ended up bumping into each other at the point where we're saying our lives did not mean a thing to wow. either one of us, no matter what direction our paths went. Mm -hmm. And so the story is about these two broken men Mm -hmm. Who who after spending a couple of years trying to figure it out? Yeah, and I never really had this deep rooted desire to write a book. Mm -hmm. I had a story, mm -hmm. and after spending time with my uncle John, I realized there's a beautiful story there. So mm -hmm. I stopped everything, went to school at Emory University, studying creative writing for two years, and I said, if I'm going to do this, yeah. I want to do it halfway decent. I'm mm -hmm. going to give it my shot. Yeah, and so. Again, it took about 10 years and, and, and three full edits and putting it aside for two years because the ending wasn't going to end up being like I thought in reality. It ended up being amazingly differently mm -hmm. uh, positive uh, than, than what I could have ever imagined. And, uh, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a deep, sometimes dark story, but it ends up being a wonderful ending to it. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, that's... I'm yeah. I, and, and I just think like it, it, when you gave me that picture of it just connecting, uh, after several years, yeah. um, what, what was that experience like for you when, when you made that connection, he made that connection together, what were some, some of the things that you experienced? I mean, was it a sense of, um, uh, partnership? Like, wow, like this is, we are together. This is a good thing. I, I think as you reconnect and and, and 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 attempt to relive some of the positives of our youth, but also some of the negatives, and really not even knowing a lot of of the of the damage that was occurring in each yeah. of our lives, we took a relationship that was close in the beginning in our youth. We mm -hmm. really went in separate directions for twenty years. Mm -hmm. We rekindled something that two very broken people would never guess that they could do. Yeah. Uh, he, he was, he was on the street and I realized that people who live, uh, that are homeless don't have mm. anybody to talk to. Mm. They don't have a soul to talk to. Yeah. And so he was more than willing. He, he had years of catching up with me. Mm -hmm. And in reality, I'm a good listener. Uh, yeah. I, I, that part of my training in business had me spend more time listening than talking. Mm -hmm. And that usually did, did me better than the other way around. And from that, we, we began to create a, a different level of bond that I mm -hmm. knew that I didn't know I even was capable of having. Yeah. And I, I'm sure it, it was the same for him. Yeah. And so this is a guy who had nothing, mm -hmm. who 
contributed nothing in life, and yet he was saving he was saving me. Mm-hmm. I, I knew I was helping him, and yeah. may, a lot of it was just let's have a meal. Here's here's some rent money. I mean, all the superficial stuff that'll just get, get get unfortunately someone that has lived that that way from point from point to point to point. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't until we spent some significant time, some deep yeah. probing time, um, and and the pain that comes from that is when we began to kind of see each other start to grow, yeah, start to change, yeah, and uh, it and that's what really motivated me to, to write the book. It's yeah. it's it is a it. it the healing came from completely unexpected directions, mm-hmm. and that's a that's a God thing. That is yeah. purely a God thing. Yeah, and, and I love that. You know the the idea. I mean, you, you mentioned this is kind of a, a ten year thing, right? It this was, whole yes. book. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the time frame um, outside of just writing that you feel like was the healing process? Because I think sometimes we live in a microwave culture where it's just like I want to make one call. I want you to tell me everything. I'm going to try to tell you everything, and that should fix it, right? But it seems like you put a tremendous amount of effort and energy and patience and vulnerability and sacrifice to say, well, I don't really agree, but I'm going to keep digging, keep digging to try to to have this. So what was it like to, to, to have to go through all of that? And, and how do you encourage other people that just want to, I just want to be healed today. And if it's not today, um, there's no hope for me. Well, I, I think for, for the story that's in this book, the healing, the healing wasn't the mission. Mm-hmm. The healing was the byproduct, but it was a significant byproduct. Mm. The mission was primarily, how do I ultimately help my uncle get off the street? Mm. How can he stay off of drugs and alcohol for at least a year Mm. of his, I mean, he'd been on drug and drug and alcohol dependent for over 50 years. Mm -hmm. And how, is there anything that I could do? Where could I, where, where could I pull the strength from anywhere I can find it, yeah. and then convince someone who doesn't trust anybody in this world because the world has been terrible to him, had mm-hmm. been terrible to him. How do I? How, how can I make that happen? And that does not come from one tra- one transaction, mm-hmm. one conversation, one trip, one two or three day trip. Mm-hmm. That takes days, weeks, months. Uh, sometimes it's separation during that period. Sometimes mm-hmm. you go, John, I can't help you. And he goes, I mean, he's in jail for three or four months mm-hmm. and and, you, and he wants to get bailed out. And I look him straight, straight in the eye and I go, if I bail you out, you, where are you going to go? Mm-hmm. I says, and he would, it, it, it is that admission that he, that, that he would go to, to go, you know, Tom, I would go back to drugs and alcohol. Let me stay here. Mm-hmm. And that was the first step. Yeah. It's little steps like that, that he was, I was helping him, but at the same time, his heart his his love for other people, mm-hmm. uh, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> his intelligence. He he was a special guy mm-hmm. caught up in the wrong body, mm-hmm. in my opinion, a, a really special soul. And so um, I, I began to see that healing start to happen in him as well. So it's just again, yeah, it's just it's amazing how if, if you it's back to that. Open it up, mm-hmm. share it, and once we started doing that, we did it a lot. Once we did yes. it a, quite a bit, and really got deep, and there were a lot of tears, there were a lot of surprises. Mm-hmm. Um, you could start to see the healing occur for both of us. It was just amazing. Yeah, I amazing. love that. I love that, and uh, I've said it a few times on the podcast. It's, it's not my quote, but it's a uh, someone said, "You can either make a point or you can make a difference." Mm. And it's very easy mm. to make a point. That's wrong. That's yep. right. Yep. Uh, but making a difference means that you have to give relational capital. No doubt. Uh, and again, not transaction, but just uh, I- I'm there for you. Um, what do you say to to people that do have uh, family members or friends? Um, because I think this is a really important thing, especially even in America. So we meet people that we may not know, that mm-hmm. maybe people are, are struggling. Maybe they have a lot of abuse in their past, and they're trying to figure out how to to, to restore that, trying to figure out how to create relationships. Um, have you found some basic principles that would help you engage with someone who maybe you don't know, but you want to help? Hmm. Well, I, you know, the, I, I think in this day and age where we're walking around with devices in our hands constant, uh, constantly, and, and unfortunately, most of us are relating to people through those devices more so than face-to-face. 
uh, I think it becomes a, a struggle even for those of my age mm-hmm. where the, everyone younger than us is like, I don't know how to relate to them anymore. So we could start to k- kind of shut down and go, mm-hmm. okay, I don't want to try. Uh, but I think that's really the key to this is to say, uh, like, I didn't know who you were mm-hmm. until you in, until you had a podcast with a friend of mine and mm-hmm. she glowed about that. Mm-hmm. And she said, this is a special guy mm-hmm. and he's doing some really good things and you should get to know the guy. Mm-hmm. And it, 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 it's almost like in this day and age, we need an invitation uh, to say that that other person is okay. You, you mm-hmm. can approach them. Yeah. Where in reality, way back when, when I was growing up, you didn't do that. You know, you just, you, you stuck your hand out there. Hey, I want to get to know you. T- tell me something about yourself. Yeah. It's, it's changed quite a bit in the last couple of decades. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to the book, what are, what are some hopes that you have if someone's reading it for the first time? What are you hoping that they walk away with? Well, uh, again, thank you for the book. That's uh, the, yeah. the, the name of the book is from punishment to peace, road trips to forgiveness. And, uh, I think that for the story itself is not going to be an easy one to read for for for, for a lot of people. Uh, it's just it, it gets deep, but by showing that two broken people can figure out mm-hmm. through the, the other person's brokenness that they can move towards a positive, mm. peaceful life, but the path to really get there is forgiveness. I mean, it is clearly for forgiveness. And uh, there's a beautiful scene at the end of the book where the antagonist of uh, John's father, he's at his deathbed. Mm. And uh, the the nephew character, which is my, uh, me, uh, I take my my, my, my friend that I just mentioned earlier that had come mm-hmm. into my investment the firm and changed my life, helped change my life thanks to Christ. Um, he's with me, and I have this mission. I just discovered by, by uh, it took a long time to figure out that the man that, that was on his deathbed mm-hmm. had molested my mother, mm-hmm. along with molested other people in my family. And I, was, I had gone into his hospital room with the idea that I was going to find the answer. I wanted him to own it, and I was prepared to do so, to do whatever, whatever I can. Now, I had my spiritual guy next to me just mm-hmm. to say, all right, keep me from grabbing a pillow and doing something with it I'm not supposed to do with it, of yeah. course. Um, but in the moment, God grabbed me, mm-hmm. and, he, and, and instead of, of asking for or demanding accountability. Mm. I asked him, uh, God put it in my heart to say, do you believe in Jesus Christ? You got, this feels like your last moments on earth. Are you, have you given your life to, to Jesus? And he was in and out. He was, he, he died two weeks later. Mm-hmm. And to be able to dredge that out of me, I, I was, it was an, the Holy Spirit grabbed me. I, I, yeah. I, I can't tell you how wow. I was taken uh, taken yeah. by that, but he gave his life to Christ mm-hmm. two weeks before he passed, and I believe he's in heaven with my grandmother and with everyone that he hurt that has since passed on, and that's my belief. Mm-hmm. And so, um, the power of allowing yourself to reach out to others in a way that even you can't even define. Yeah. You might be able to do it, but I think you, it, it's going to take a, a very significant Holy Spirit, spiritual movement push for me, a kick, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. kicking and screaming. Um, but it, in the end, the, the beauty of the story was that forgiveness uh, can occur but not just the people who've, who've aggrieved ourselves uh, and, and, uh, and others, but to ourselves. We, mm-hmm. I'm firmly believe that those punishers, mm-hmm. the, the, punished of, uh, the punished of the people who've abused us, we become the punishers as well, mm-hmm. to one degree or another. Yeah. And we don't see it that way. Mm-hmm. We're, we're trying to heal ourselves over the course of our life. Me, jobs, achievement, money, whatever it turns out to be. And in the meantime, I was hurting people in the process. Mm-hmm. I didn't know it. I didn't think I. I didn't think I was. I was mm-hmm. out there doing what I thought I was supposed to do to be a father and a son, mm-hmm. and a and a husband. Mm-hmm. And yet, that was a lie. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, to 
to have gone through the effort of forgiving not only my father, but John's father and what he had done to family members for me, mm-hmm. flipped back on me in that same moment uh, as I was leaving, uh, spending that time with my step-grandfather at his deathbed. And I realized that I needed to forgive myself, mm-hmm. that I was as much the punisher as anyone that had been in this story. And that's where I found my finish line of peace yeah. was to be able to do that. And so wow. that's what this 10 year journey was all about for me. And I'm just, I'm, I'm as proud of that as anything I've ever done in my life. It's been a wonderful journey. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, thank you so much for a sharing that story verbally, but being able to, to, to write that because it, it seems to me that, uh, you know, you're kind of fulfilling that, that, that Acts 1, 8 through 10, where it says, be witnesses to this resurrection, to the power of the resurrection, uh, because forgiveness, right, is so key uh, to Christianity. And so you're being a witness to say, listen, what you're looking for in this and this and this will never be accomplished, exactly. but you can find it here. Yep. Um, and you're being a witness to that. You're not just saying it from, you know, um, a fan, but you're actually a participant. You you you've engaged in it on on a, on a personal level. And so, um, tell me a little bit about uh, this idea of forgiveness. Um, it should come naturally to us. We should be able to define forgiveness. Um, but but how do you define forgiveness? I think forgiveness is in layers. I think that I think our ego rises up in the beginning when we think, oh, you know what? I can I forgive him. You know, just mm-hmm. you know, he'll never he'll never I, I won't let him do anything else to me ever again, but I can forgive him and I can move on in life. That's the easiest thing I think a guy mm-hmm. can do is to say, yeah, I, I forgive him. I move on. I'm I'm strong. Mm-hmm. Um but that's not very easy to truly do when mm-hmm. you when uh, when you wake up the next morning and you go and, and that thought's still there mm-hmm. and that it, and it just it, yeah yeah I forgive me I forgive me I mean just keep doing that till you realize no I really had mm-hmm. I mean maybe I have to some degree but I've not released it completely mm-hmm. my heart's not healed um, enough from that act. Of mm-hmm. of attempting to forgive, and forgiveness doesn't necessarily have to be me forgive you in person. Yeah, I mean, in many cases, in fact, a couple of characters in the book, there's no way that could have happened. They passed on, mm-hmm. and so um, a lot of it has to do with accepting the fact that you can't change what had happened. Mm-hmm. You can't change the other person. Mm-hmm. You can only accept the understanding that yes, they hurt you. Mm-hmm that it can't, you, you can't get that back. Mm-hmm. And that the only person that's truly going to benefit from forgiveness is going to be the one that's the, the forgiver has mm-hmm. to be. Yeah. And so I, again, I don't think it's a on off switch. I think it's mm-hmm. a dimmer and that dimmer may take a long time for that to get all the way to the brightest light. Mm-hmm. But, um, but starting is the key yeah. is, is just saying, okay, get my heart in the right spot and let's see where God could take me. Yeah, I love that. I love that. What uh, what would you say to someone who says, yeah, that all sounds great, Tom, but you don't know what I've gone through and I cannot, I can't get there. How would you encourage them uh, to see what you see? I am a huge believer that finding a person, a group, a colony, whatever you want to call it, of people who are of the like mind to want to seek an answer, to seek understanding. Uh, That is the biggest, I think, the most significant move that any of us can make, in my Mm -hmm. opinion. Finding someone that says, I can trust you and I don't have to know you. I don't have to, I, I could have just, I just met you. Mm-hmm. You could have told me nothing about you. Mm-hmm. And yet, because we're sitting in a room together talking, mm-hmm. I can probably trust telling you things that I've never trust, uh, told anyone yeah. because you can't hurt me. Mm-hmm. I, I, 
we, you don't know me well enough to hurt me. Yeah. And so that's what the beauty, I think, of a small group environment is, where 10, 12 guys, using guys as an example, yep. 10, 12 guys who carry all sorts of different challenges, having struggling kids, have a wife, have a marriage that's not working, had uh, dad, dad was terrible, mom was an alcoholic, N- name it, I've had a bad career, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the challenges are that all of us carry to some degree or another. The question is, how hard do we carry it? Mm-hmm. We all got something. Yeah. Unfortunately, when when they happen when in our youth, and they've happened a long time during our youth, that's what we carry the deepest and the hardest through our lives. Mm-hmm. So finding a group, though, that are just willing to listen. Mm-hmm. Once you listen, the empathy muscle starts to yeah. starts to, to, ex- to get exercised, and that's when you start to open up yeah. and you start to share, and then and and this back and forth, yeah, becomes an amazing moment or yeah. amazing time together, yeah. And that's where the healing starts mm-hmm. is to say, I've got, I'm, I'm, I'm receiving permission by someone else telling me that they had experienced something very similar to that when they were a kid. Mm-hmm. Because we always think we're the only ones that experience the way we, whatever we've experienced, 100%. no one could have gone through mm-hmm. what we've been through. But that's that's the falsehood of yeah. of that thinking completely. Mm-hmm. Way too many people have gone through what we've been through. We just had yeah. different versions. It's that dad or that mom yeah. or that brother yeah. or that yeah. uncle, whatever it turned out to be. Um, but in reality, we all carry something. In the fact that, again, when when we share. That opens up others to share with us, and then we begin to relate to, well, you know what? I, I remember something like that happened to me. Let me share with you Yeah, yes. my experience of whatever that is. Mm-hmm. And almost every time that I've ever experienced that, I've seen men in tears. Mm-hmm. I've seen joy. Mm-hmm. I've seen some form of healing. It may only last a few minutes, a day, a yeah. week, a month. But it'll happen. Mm -hmm. And the question is whether you can keep it going or not, where you can get it deep enough to where you can really kind of pull out all that muck that all of us carry to one degree or another. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And even um, I know as a pastor, when I get a chance to hear people's stories, you know, it, it, it has a similar bent to it, right? There's a story of a lot of times we're born into brokenness, then we try to fix it. Like you said, going in different routes. And yet we still find ourselves still broken. Absolutely. It's like, I've done this and I've done this. And yet the same, we, we're still in the, almost in the same position that we started. And no so doubt. where do we go from here? Mm-hmm. And that conversation leads to, you know, the next step. What is that? And, um, and I've heard this saying too, that, um, you know, a lot of times what's associated with um, brokenness and betrayal, uh, an emotion that seems to rise is bitterness. Bitterness begins to find its way into our hearts. And um, I heard the saying that bitterness is a poison that you drink expecting someone else to die because you're holding it against that, them and they don't absolutely care. Absolutely right. They're, they're, they're living their lives. They're doing whatever they're doing right. and you're like bitter yes. towards them. It's yes. not, it's not hurting them, No, you're but right. it's hurting you. You're right. And so, but again, it just, it, and then it, that, now I feel the weight of that. And so it's being able to express that with someone else who truly cares for you. Exactly. Uh, is the initial process because yes. we're we need to get it out. Um, again, even going back to uh I love the, the story in Genesis where uh Adam and Eve they sin, they go hide, and the first thing we see God do is he shows up and says, Adam, where are you? God knows where Adam is, but Adam needs to know where he is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so God doesn't say, how dare you? He says, Adam, where are you? It's a question. It's a form of conversation. Sure. It's relational in aspect. And so being able to say, hey, where are you? I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? You know, so that's the process that we have to get to in order to do that. 100%. So, yeah, so for- forgiveness is obviously super, uh, super important, not only in just in, in just normal day-to-day relationships, but long-term, that process of, of healing yes, as well. Absolutely. Um, so, well, uh, as far as um, what are some elements necessary uh, that you would say for forgiveness to take place? We talked a little bit about them. What are some necessary elements for, for forgiveness to take place? It has to start with understanding. It has to, it, it has to be, it, I think the, the, the punished mm-hmm. has to begin the process of understanding why the punisher is the punisher. 
because in virtually every case, they've had something that they've carried mm-hmm. and they've not been able to handle it. In in both cases, the, the, the and keep in, uh, this is amazing. We're day after Father's Day, and this book is about two sons and two fathers, yeah. and 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 in the difficulties in the difficulty, excuse me, that they both had, uh, and yet part of the healing that these two primary characters in the book uh, achieved Mm -hmm. was the understanding and the acceptance of the fact that their, their fathers had had very difficult lives in their own right. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know how to triangulate Mm -hmm. into their levels of peace to then translate that to, to being fathers to their sons. And so, I think that's the uh, empathy. It's probably mm-hmm. get back to that. I don't want to overuse that word. Yeah, but it's empathy. It's mm-hmm. it's beginning to think that it's not always it. It's not me. I I, I it, I'm not. I'm the one that's. I'm not the one. Excuse me. That is the wrong here. Or and for the longest time, as far as my father was concerned, I thought it was me. Mm-hmm. I couldn't live up to his expectation, and it wasn't until my first of four stepmothers. So I had. Five mothers, wow. by the way. So the one that was the stepmother that was around in my teenage years, we had gotten, we, we we kept up. We were we were good friends over the years. It wasn't until she sat me down as I just started the research of this book, and she said, she called me Tommy. She says, Tommy, don't you know your father was ill? In that simple sentence, mm. it's like the clouds parted. Yeah, wow. it's like. It wasn't about me. My dad was ill. And she began to kind of share what her experiences were. And I started to connect the dots. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I came to the conclusion, it wasn't me at all. Mm-hmm. I just, it, it, I had, it's how I treated it that mm-hmm. ended up not being the right thing. I, I, I wished I'd had that knowledge decades before. I wonder yeah. how different my life would have been. How I saw life from that point going forward, how maybe different I could have been to, uh, for others, but I found out. Very fortunate to have found out. But in reality, it's the it's it's the empathy. It's like yeah. they carry. Usually, abusers carry something pretty heavy along with them mm-hmm. that they have not been able to, to to sort through, and they end up pushing that towards others to kind of get them to feel better. Yeah, and yeah. I had to learn that the hard way. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, yeah, no, that's. I think, again, this conversation, uh, I hope frees people to be able to have those communities, to find that community. Uh, listen, I, I tell my me and my wife, we, we go to counseling or we read a marriage book once every other year because it's not like it's not like our, our, our marriage is the wheels are falling off, but I need fine tuning all the time because I'm so used to getting off like a quarter of an inch off. And then later on, I'm way away from no doubt. North Star. No doubt. And so being able to have intentional conversation that says, I, I need people to be, to well, I would always say if, if, if they love God, if they love the church and they love you, man, that's a really great combination that's of people great. that will help you get to where you need that's to go. That's a great combination. Yeah. No and so that. it's just like, all right, if you're that kind of person, I want to listen to you. Sure. I'll put myself in that humble position uh, to be able to, to, to learn about a little bit more about my life so that I can become more like what I'm asking uh, and, and praying for. So I don't think our society could, could get too much of that. Mm. We really need that. I think yeah. all of us need that to one degree or another. We really do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things that we talk about even here is the idea of this community and uh, the things that we enjoy about this community. Sure. Uh, you know, things are changing, like you said. I mean, even with work, people are able to do remote now. And so they don't have to be in the big cities to do big things. So mm-hmm. some people look at Americas and they're like, man, this might be a great place for me to move. We have two colleges here or sure. 5,000 students. Yeah. Like, what are some elements of this community that you would uh, you would say these are elements that anyone from anywhere would want to come because they, these are great values that uh, that you would you would almost like you're pitching Americas to people. I think one of the things that my that my wife Diane and I have 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 really embraced, and, uh, and it took a minute to kind of gravitate toward it, but it didn't take that long. Is that if you live in a big city, you go to a restaurant or you go to a dry cleaner or you just do business, do life around the businesses that you do life with. It, you, th- there's there's no connection. It's it's a transaction. We you, you used that earlier. Yeah. 
but in a town like America's, mm. you know the people. Yeah. Uh, I see up on your banner, Horn, uh, Horn Pecan Company. Yeah. One of my clients. Yeah. I go in and drink coffee there all the time. Pat's place. Yeah. I mean, we know Pat. I mean, mm. I've spent a lot of time with Pat. I can go, I can go all through your banner here <laughs> and, and, say, and say, you know, I, I know all these people. Mm. And you don't think about that when you're in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. I mean, you might enjoy a restaurant and you go there multiple times, but at the end of the day, mm-hmm. that's hard to really be be the be the norm that walks into a Cheers uh, at a at a restaurant in Atlanta. They remember your name. You sit down at the bar and you have a steak and a, and a and an old fashioned. I mean, yeah. that doesn't happen that often. It happens, but it's 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 hard. Yeah. Not in America. So I yeah. think that, uh, and it's, I think primarily because there are, there are. Good opportunities here, but there's not a plethora of it. I mean, there's just mm-hmm. uh, the, the, America has everything that anyone would want to want to have when they when they moved here mm-hmm. or would move here, and that's been the case for us. Uh, and yet, you know, it's it's seeing these same people and getting to know who they are, and and these are entrepreneurs and business yeah. owners like Pat has been around forever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, and so it's it's just uh, it, it's different, and it's it's a. It's heart led. Mm-hmm. I believe that's the case. Is that yeah. people who want to do business with you because they genuinely mm-hmm. want to to be a provider of pizza or coffee yeah. or insurance or whatever it turns out to be or a beautiful hotel. Yeah. Uh, that as opposed to just it's a business. I could stay at the hotel. I could drink a cup of coffee. But in America, it feels a lot different. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, when I first moved here, I mean, people were asking me, neighbors were asking me, like, uh, what insurance company are you using? And they're not asking for transactions. They're asking because they want to know, I know that person, and I also know that person. (laughs) And they just want to tell you about the people that do. It's just like, they they care. They're just like, oh, I want to tell you about him or her. It was It's an amazing experience. It is. Uh, And in fact, when we were moving in, my wife went to a grocery store and someone asked, Hey, are are you the ones that are just moving in? I I noticed you from my house, so they're like paying attention to people that are moving in because they're like, oh, well, you're and me. that happened a lot when you when you take four years to renovate a house in yeah. in, in this town, <laughs> everybody knows what you're doing, and and I I, I can't yeah I can think of dozens of people uh-huh. that have hey I love what you're doing to your house, and I'm thinking that's great, thank you very much. Can I introduce myself to you? I have no idea who <laughs> yes. you are, and yet, yeah, but yeah, that's what's part of a small town mm-hmm. is that. People know what's going on. They care enough to yeah. know what's going on. And when and we're new people that move here. We're we're drinking from the fire hydrant. We're yeah. trying to just get to remember one or two names that yeah. we'd we'd run into and where to go and what to do. But uh, but America's yeah. is really kind of special when it comes to things. Yeah, like that. I, sure. I agree. I mean, that's and so even when I when I I'm asking the question, what is it that we should never stop doing? I think that's what we're talking about. That's what makes America's America's. Where you know the idea of fellowship is. Well, I know these people, so I'm going to have fellowship with these people where hospitality is I'm going to meet a stranger and I'm going to welcome mm. them in. Mm. And mm-hmm. that's America's. Yeah. America's is very hospitable. Um, and I think we can continue to work on that uh, where not only are we networking and making sure that people feel connected and relational, but even to the steps of, I want to invite them over to my house, sure. have dinner with them, sure. get, a, get go go a little bit deeper to have mm-hmm. these conversations Absolutely. and see where they are. Absolutely. So, so even as far as looking forward towards the future of America, you know, five, 10 years, what are some things, we've talked about some things that we that make America's America's. What are some things that we, we would love to see in America's uh, and whether that's on the positive or even just the kind of the, the things that we need to work on the obstacles that we're wrestling with? Well, you know, that is a wonderful question that never has a easy answer. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think that America's like my hometown of Memphis, like a lot of Southern towns, has its challenges and mm-hmm. it's rooted from hundreds of years of history. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and I don't know whether that, I, I always hope it will change. Mm-hmm. I always hope it'll get better. And you see little snippets of that always uh, happening from time to time, but it just seems like it needs to be a bigger uh, energy level mm-hmm. to make it really Im- be, be impactful. And so I think a lot of that starts with just, the government, the government leadership, and their mm-hmm. involvement with the community, and and how they want to reach out to, to uh, to everyone to 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 make America say community and not just a group of three or four or six groups on one in different corners of the city. Yeah, uh, and so uh, I, I really I, I really hope that over time, 
that the that the local governments really do as best they can yeah. to try to make that uh, really project that out and do what they can to 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 help bring in businesses here. I mean, there's a there's plenty of uh, opportunity here. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, my wife's head of human resources at Magnolia Manor, and so she she has her finger on a lot of go- what's going on in the labor market and. Mm. And and there's just there's just opportunities here that 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 um, maybe most of us don't understand or appreciate, mm-hmm. um, but maybe that's part of what we all need to be doing in selling America is just to say, hey, if you just moved here, if you're looking for a job, hey, I got a wife that that yeah. kind of might be hiring somebody. Yeah. So I, I think there's a lot of that that we need to stop again. Back to the I don't want to mm-hmm. oversell this, but maybe stop looking at our devices and more looking eyeball to eyeball at people. Yeah. Because that's again starting those conversations can lead to I know somebody that could possibly help you, or you might want to try this restaurant. Pat's really good at pizza, or whatever yeah. it turns out to be. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And and as I've been interviewing and talking with people, it does seem like there is a there's so much potential here. I mean, again, with the two colleges here, yeah. oh, uh, with um, I mean, the entrepreneurs that are here, they're looking for a place, and just the living expenses here give so much opportunity for businesses to come and look around. And so, yeah, if we can continue to find ways to incentivize people and encourage people to come here, make it easier or as easy as possible to invest here. I think that would be uh, great. I want to tell you one story if you allow me a minute yeah. or two. So I met a lady, um, her name is Jackie Holmes. And I, I don't know, I, I met her through a connection that my wife Diane had and, 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 and Kim Christmas, the, uh, who, who I've worked with uh, in, in some consulting in the past. Uh, she, she's head of human resources for a company that's uh, called mm-hmm. Pharmacentra. Okay. Uh, and, is, is, and has headquartered here for a long time. And uh, I met Jackie and, and, and I just fell in love with Jackie. I, mm-hmm. I, uh, Jackie's African American, been around a long time, uh, born and raised here, was, uh, had a very small um, child care facility here in town, uh, maybe eight to 10 kids. Mm-hmm. And yet I, I was seeing this. And at the same time, I was hearing uh, Diane uh, state that, America's really needed really high quality child care that was just not enough in in the marketplace that Diane was attempting to try to find good people mm-hmm. to to come to work at Magnolia Manor the biggest challenge one of the biggest challenges they had was good child care mm-hmm. and so uh, one thing led to another and I was able to be involved with Jackie to help her get some amazing financing mm-hmm. uh, very low interest rate financing uh, to to buy an old facility, old child care facility had just a few kids, maybe a dozen max. Yeah. The old the owner just wasn't doing it right. She goes and and renovates it. She's got a hundred kids now and serving the community in such an amazing Love way. Love that. And it starts with mm-hmm. someone saying the city needs something. Let's figure out how to make it happen. So yes. it's like so it's a conversation that's then that creates an introduction that creates to I've got an idea to yes. now there's. A, now there are a hundred families are able to have their kids taken care of and they can yeah. go out and, and provide for their family going forward in, in, in Sumter I County. That. I just, it's a great story. I, yeah. I'm very proud of Jackie for what she's done. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, th- and we need more of that. I we agree. need more I people agree. that again, entrepreneurs, they, they have passion, they have drive and more than likely they have tenacity. Mm-hmm. But a lot of that time of trying to figure out, well, all the even the bylaws and putting structures together and the systems, it can and be then, a big hurdle. It really can yeah, be. Yeah. And so, if we can come around them and say, "Hey, we can't do the work for you, but we can definitely point you in the right direction because you have passion and drive to figure it out." Absolutely. Instead of going, "Well, they'll figure it out," well, they probably won't. You have to encourage them. Hey, read mm-hmm. this document. Mm-hmm. Sign these papers. Let's go, or let, or let's um, walk into a bank yeah. together and talk to them and see what they say. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's, that's what, and that's what ended up yeah. happening with Jackie. And yeah, myself, and that's so. a great way for us as people. Uh, again, we always talk about next level neighboring. That's that. That's you don't have to wait for an organization. You don't have to wait for anything. You can be a next level neighbor by saying, "Hey, I see that you have great potential. Let me connect you yeah. with this. Where person. do you want to go with it? Yep. And I might know somebody. Yes. Or I do know somebody. That's right. Or Talk to that person, whatever. It's yeah. just, I, I think we could all, there could always be more of that. Yep. No matter how much is being done now, there could always be more. Yep, absolutely. All right. Uh, I, I got a question, uh, two personal questions for you as sure. well. Um, 
I, you've probably done, you know, you, you've talked a lot, I, I think, about your life. People have asked you probably tons of questions, especially as this book continues to come out. Yes. Uh, what have been some common just mis, misconceptions about you, just personally, as, as people will get a chance to know you? What are some common misconceptions? Well, I, I, I my wife, Diane, I, I, I keep overselling her, but she is the, the center of my universe, of course, as, as she should be. Um, she, she, uh, put together a couple of efforts around getting this book done. One was called, this is so clever, called uh, Read Between the Wines. And so she invited a half a dozen people close by that we knew and, 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 and to get them to help with ideas and editing the book, she pour wine, you know, just just doing this. I'm thinking, okay, I, I need yeah. advice. I don't care yeah. if they're half drunk if they just give me good advice. That's, <laughs> That's all right. I care yeah. about. Uh, and the other was uh, we had a we had a local uh, uh, America's book signing about a month and a half ago, mm-hmm. and she organized, and we had 40 people come over to our home, and we're just so blessed to have that kind that that level of interest, and mm-hmm. and I think that. Uh, those, those, I think people around here who have seen us only known us as being the people who work at Magnolia Manor or stuck in his house uh, mm-hmm. that he just renov- that they just renovated and, uh, and, and, and maybe stuck up, maybe don't know him as well as he was, is, is, is he's not out there that much. Uh, when they come to the, come to the house and, and spend time and to share with the, with what the book is, they're like, they don't expect anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that what was written in the book uh, mm-hmm. is what they've been seeing or what they've been used to seeing uh, yeah. in our presence in America for the last nine years. So it's a, yeah. been kind of a fun journey with that. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, all right. Um, out of, again, people asking you a ton of questions, uh, is there is there a particular question that you, ex- you expect that people uh, to ask, but they haven't asked yet? Like it, it, like as far as expectations, like oh, I'm surprised they haven't asked about this. Well, no, not really. Okay. I mean, I, I, it's almost like I'd be surprised if they did. Yeah, but I, maybe that's a time of a time of uh, this this age that we're in right now. It's almost yeah. like I would love for. I mean, I, if you read the book, John, and I mm-hmm. hope you do. Yeah. It is it is about as open book mm-hmm. of, a, of a life as anyone would ever not only be comfortable with, but probably be uncomfortable with. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I, I'm pretty much a an open book kind of guy. Yeah. So uh, maybe this podcast is going to open up a couple of people. You know, and I've, got, I've always <laughs> yeah. had this one question I'm going to ask that guy. <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, I've never really, yeah. uh, I've never felt like there was someone, I might think, you know, what, yeah. do they, should they ask a question about this particular thing? Usually... I'll tell them before they even ask the question. Yeah. <laughs> if if we've got a good dialogue going, yeah, so that's kind of how it I works. I love that. Great. Um, all right, so we we kind of end each podcast with what we call rapid fire questions. Okay. They're just short questions uh, and answers. Uh, so we just want to get a chance to get to know you a little bit. Sure. Um, all right. So as a writer, uh, what is your favorite book or author? Uh, John Grisham. Okay. And in uh, the firm. Uh, okay. It's filmed in Memphis. It was written about Memphis. It was the first John Grisham book. I've, I've got my name in one of his books. No, way. I have Get every one here. of his signed first editions at home. <laughs> I'm a big John Grisham fan. Oh my goodness! Uh, I think my wife and I just rewatched that movie uh, a few weeks ago. It's so a, it's a really good. It's a good. It was yeah, it's well a good done. story. Uh, it's a good story. She she reads the books and we watch. Yeah, the, I get uh, it. Sure, so. <laughs> sure. I get it. Um, all right. Uh, are you a coffee or tea person? Coffee. Okay. Do you take it black or black. you? I love it. All yes. right. Um, what about um, dogs or cats? Got a dog named Lacey. She's of 12 pounds. She owns the house. She's a <laughs> uh, part Shih Tzu and part, and part Bichon. They, they call her, um, uh, what do they call her, Diane? Mm-hmm. Zushan. That's right. I forgot. <laughs> Zushan. Yeah. Zushan. <laughs> it, 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 weird name, but it's yep. just a cute little dog. It's a dog. Love it. Love it. All right. Uh, Are you an early bird or a night owl? Oh, I get up at four in the morning. All right. Um, Do you have a go-to comfort food? Do you just love to eat? You're just... Uh, just Well, my my grandfather, my father's father owned an ice cream novelty manufacturing business in Memphis. Wow. Okay. So I cannot go down the ice cream aisle of any grocery store in the entire world without (laughs) gawking at whatever's there. And if it's anything new, it's sold. I mean, I always try something different, but... Uh, It's probably going to be ice cream. Okay. It's in my blood. All right. Um, Do you have a favorite hobby? 
<laughs> you know what? Uh, we we have a second place. We our lives are, are a little bit different. So most people, if they have a second home, they live in the city and go and spend time in the in the weekends in the country. Mm-hmm. Diane and I do the complete opposite. Okay. So we're here during the week, and and some in, in a lot of weekends we go up to Atlanta. Uh huh. We got kids there, and so we live awesome. right on the Atlanta Belt Line. If you're familiar mm-hmm. with that, it's mm-hmm. uh, beautiful. It's a it, it's a great recreational area it's growing by leaps and bounds and apartments and restaurants and bars and whatever else is Mm -hmm. kind of building all around it and so i I think just getting out as you get older you're like okay i'm gonna have to keep this body going somehow so you start to walk more and 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 sit a lot less and so that's what we end up doing a lot okay uh you you said you traveled a lot do you have a, a destination that you would love to go or go back to i was very fortunate to go to hangzhou china uh, for 11 days and, uh, never been to China, haven't been since. And I think just learning a different culture, completely different Mm. than what I've been accustomed to, to in in my life. Uh, it was just an eye opening experience for me. So uh, I love to take Diane to, to China. I think that's been something we talk about and Italy. We've never, neither one of us have been to Italy and I I think we'd love to try Tuscany. She's, she loves her wine. And so uh, okay. I'd be yeah. honored to take her out there and have her. She has an amazing, she could be the sommelier of America. <laughs> she has that kind of a set of taste buds. So love it. Uh, she could, I, I can't wait for her to show me some wine out in Italy sometime. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. All right. Uh, last question. If you could have dinner with any three people living or dead, who would that be? <sighs> I'd start with Jesus. Yeah. I'd, That'll be entertainment at its uh-huh. finest. Yeah. I'm sure you would agree with that, mm-hmm. John. I'd want dinner with my dad. Mm. I think I would want my I wouldn't dinner with my dad. Mm-hmm. I always think about him. He died before I did the book. Mm-hmm. And I wonder how our relationship would be now, mm-hmm. having experienced that. The forgiveness part. Yeah. And who is the third? Um, well, I have to go. Tony Vitalo. So, Tony, most people in America may not know who he is. If he's, a, if you're as any kind of a Southeastern Conference sports guy mm-hmm. or girl, a gal, uh, he is. Uh, he leads the University of Tennessee's baseball team that okay. uh, right now in the World Series, and he's like the, the, the it baseball coach right mm-hmm. now. And so I think he, he has a he has a great philosophy. He he speaks well to yeah. media, and so having a Having a latte with him would yeah, be a lot of fun. So that's right. Jesus, Dad, and Tony. That's right. That'd be good for right. me. That well, would be a you fun. know, if Tony ever listens, I mean, you're a business consultant. You would love to have coffee with him, you know, maybe give him some advice. There you, you know, go. Just I see how he spend his money, right? Yeah, that's there right. There you go. I could do so, that. Anyway. Uh, Tom, thank you so much for coming you, on the America's Podcast. It really means a lot to me to, to get a chance to get to know you. Same here. Uh, I will be reading this book. Um, I'm already uh, encouraged by it and uh, and where it, lay, where, it, where it heads, where it leads, uh, not just for for me personally, but also just for this community. I hope our community really embraces it as well. And then we take steps towards this together because I do think that this book leads us to even a greater thriving community than what we have now. I agree hundred percent, John. Thank you for the time here. I really appreciate it. All right. Good. All right, guys. Okay. Yeah. Thank, you, right. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take uh, two quick pictures. You can stay right there. All right. Um, so yeah, let me get, uh, thank you so much. Fantastic. Oh, I enjoyed uh, it too.